Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Agronomists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And Ray DeBanco, who would have thought that a snow report would get everybody in the comments uh, hopping this early? All right, tonight, uh, Tonight's show is going to be a really good one. I've got three guests, a hot topic. Uh, there's quite a few things going on. Tonight's episode does qualify as a knowledge sharing event. Um, and so for anyone who's here because of that, welcome. Uh, we hope you have a great evening. And stick around, of course, to the end of the show. We'll have a QR code for both our friends in Western Canada and uh, here in Ontario. So just stick around to the end for that. Uh, quick snow report around the horn. I am one of the lucky ones here west of Ottawa. We got mm, maybe two to three centimeters. Uh, the wind has howled, but we completely missed the giant storms that uh, that many had. So I'll be asking my guests as well. Of course, um, in addition to being a knowledge share sharing event, uh, we are always uh, CEU credit ready. So head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Uh, tomorrow and let us know that you took in the broadcast and you can qualify for those CEU credits as well. Um, and of course, we have our show sponsors and thank them very much. Uh, tonight's show is brought to you by Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture, Disruptors, an RBC podcast, Canola Master Contest, and of course, Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Without further ado, let's bring in our panel tonight. We are talking about nitrogen management. We are going to focus on managing those losses. And uh, I could not do this conversation, I think, with anyone else. Joining me, Peter Wee, Pete Johnson, here with Real Agriculture, Greg Stewart with Mazex, and John Hurd, Soil Safari himself with Manitoba Agriculture. Welcome here, gents. Thank you very much. Hey. All right. Uh, well, John, you're the lone Manitoban, so we'll start with you. What is the snow report where you are? Uh, well, it's here now and it will be gone in March. You know, <laughs> we learned to live with it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, that's one thing that really uh, disrupts me. I think you're the disruptors on it. People often talk about how much snow there is and it's irrelevant because it can fall out here and as you know, it blows around and it accumulates in the bush and the fields are bare. So when you're told you've had 15 centimeters of snow, what's that in inches? Five or six? six anyway, so you get six. that much snow, uh, uh, you'll get, uh, I've, I've got a foot and a half in my yard and two inches in the field. Hmm. All right. But John, don't you go out and roll the snow? The guys in Saskatchewan are rolling the snow to keep it in the field so it doesn't blow into the bush. Well, Peter, I don't know I about that, but, <laughs> but usually about the time it gets to be the 1st of April, we've been known to burn the snow to get rid of it. I I have seen that on April 1st, everyone. There is a yeah. YouTube floating around with the blowtorches. Um, that, it is the true. date that you're allowed to start burning snow. <laughs> that, is, that is the day. Um, all right, Peter, I will ask you in a moment, but Greg, uh, where are you based and what is the snow? Yeah, I'm in Ingersoll as well, and I don't know, we got maybe four or five inches, and most of it is melted by this afternoon late. Okay. So it still feels a little too early for winter in, in Ontario, though, for me, anyway. I just, every day that we're not buried is just a blessing in my books. Anyway, Pete, uh, there certainly, uh, this weekend was quite scary on the roads for many areas. Uh, what about where you are? Yeah, so actually, I happen to live in Ingersoll, same as Greg, but where the farm is in Lucan, man, just we get those lake effect flurries, nothing like Warren was talking about and some of the folks in the chat where, you know, Buffalo getting that, that five and six feet of snow, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, but we did get a nice bit of snow coming off the lake, but it's, it's really interesting is Saturday night at the Perth County Federation Harvest Gala, and it wasn't there was that much snow maybe five or six inches like greg says but the wind blew and the ground drifting was just horrendous and you know another great twitter t thread uh dungan and dan tweeting out that his live cover crop 
keeping mm -hmm. the road bare and dry so you could drive safe because it was trapping all that snow, no ground drifting, and those doggone die hard uh, tillage people, you know, the, the, the testosterone tillage people, the snow blowing across and slippery and slidey and, mm -hmm. and just brutal. Well, and I will say that we moved uh, about 350 of our ewes into some of that exact green, tall cover crop stuff, and uh, it's lovely and sheltered. And so I say thank you. Um, okay, tonight, this is this is good. And yes, there are all sorts of things on these topics that we could cover, but we do need to dig into it because we only have about an hour and we want to cover as much as we can. So I'm going to start, yes, snow talk is good, but also so is humor. And so um, Jay, if you could put up, we're gonna start by framing this conversation. We've always talked about nitrogen management because of course it matters for dollars and cents, it matters for yields, um, but of course it has an increased uh, reason date, let's say, uh, because we are facing potentially regulation, but at least aspirational goals. And um, as tonight uh, will attest to, there is some money out there um, as well for managing some of our nitrogen loss. So um, if everyone wants to share, I would love to know who actually um, put this together um, and, and shared it. But uh, there we go. We've had more than enough attention on end management. Okay. So uh, Dr. John Hurd, I'm going to start with you. First, we got to start with why we're even having this conversation, which is we can lose nitrogen. So if you will, take it away. How do we lose nitrogen? How do we manage for those losses? Okay, well, th thanks for that. And I, I guess this is the lesson where we, we need, well, some people think that we could just tell stories about this, but the bottom line is that it's science. Nitrogen is chemistry. Let me get my thumb in here. It's, it's chemistry and it's biology and it's physics. And anyone that tries to really dumb it down too much uh, uh, is going to kind of miss those pathways. And, uh, you know, I'm fairly brutal when we do training here with farmers. He said, if you don't get it, hire someone that does know those things uh, so that you do have that. And, uh, and attend some more scientific courses so that you can get your chemistry, physics, and biology figured out in that. So I had a couple- Johnson, Johnson you're probably excluded already from tonight's discussion. Already you're, you're, you're out. <laughs> don't, don't worry, Greg. I've, I've got the nitrogen cycle for dummies coming up here. There we and go, there. This, this will make it all clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'll, I'll be honest, John, I do okay on chemistry, I'm pretty good on biology, but the physics parts get, that gets me a little scared. I'll be honest. Okay. All right. Physics is the most fun. So, well, the reason is, is because in school, they made you memorize that cycle that's in the upper left hand corner. And we still do that to people. And uh, Greg, you've got a great picture that you use in your talks of people with their uh, yawning in class, when you talk about the nitrogen cycle. So we constructed uh, what's below there, uh, a simple kind of high school plumbing project about how, uh, where nitrogen goes. And uh, if I can, we can go the next, uh, speak of technology, I don't think that damn thing works. Anyways, so <laughs> the lo lo looking at this, uh, that this is gonna be the nitrogen cycle, we're gonna work through this, but if you might imagine at the top there, that funnel, that's where the nitrogen goes in. And I want it, all of it to go all the way down to the bucket on the right bottom right hand side. And if we had that, we'd have 100% nitrogen use efficiency. But that's kind of like asking Peter to go to the store and looking to buy a loaf of bread and sending him with a $10. And so he starts but then he runs into a panhandler with lottery tickets, and then he has to walk past the pub, and then he has to walk past the pool hall. And by the time he gets to the grocery store, he's got four bucks left. And nitrogen's kind of the same. There are too many distractions along the way. And so our nitrogen's distracted. Sometimes it's just 
lost for a while. Sometimes it's lost permanently, but uh, we kind of got to know where where to avoid those uh, those hazards and things. So yeah, the best we can get is forty to sixty percent of the nitrogen we put on in the plant. We don't do right. we don't do any better than that. But John, just be careful. It's forty to sixty percent of the nitrogen in the plant. It doesn't mean that that other forty to sixty percent automatically disappears from the landscape, right? Like we no, we can hold it, it, in the landscape, but, and and so you're not saying that that's all an environmental concern. Some would say that, Peter, but you and I know that uh, the rest is tied up often in that bi biology. That's uh, yeah. soil life, that organic pool that sustains us. And we really can't measure the nitrogen in there with a soil test, but it's there. You, you folks in Ontario know that because you don't trust the nitrate soil test, but you still have nitrogen released the following year. So um, yeah, we know that's there, just hard to count on and hard to measure, at, at yeah. least for us in the West. And, and I know for so, some people, looking at this on a smaller screen that it's a bit hard to see so you may have to blow it up but we're actually now john walk us through the the different components because we'll blow it up and and try to help people understand mm -hmm. the the chemistry sure. yeah. and the physics and the biology sure okay we'll go to the next slide there and uh uh the first place that our nitrogen might be distracted or or permanently lost uh, would be volatilization of like surface applied urea or, or UAN. And that's where, uh, as our uh, colored water leaks through our pipe here, this is the first avenue where we lose it. And uh, the good thing is we have management that we know can turn that tap off. Uh, uh, we can use the urease inhibitors, which there's a, quite a number of them now. Or for us, simply in good in soil placement, uh, Greg, you're maybe going to talk about that later with some studies you've done uh, or, or give me some rainfall or irrigation and then we'll lock that into the soil and reduce the volatilization. So that pathway is well known. We kind of know how to control it. But one of the things that John, just so that everybody for sure understands this, is that the urea is coming in from the top of that slide, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah whether you get either some rainfall, so those three nice little tabs, we either, if we can get some rainfall, that's going to stop the volatilization or reduce the volatilization as long as we get at least that four tenths, half an inch, certainly more than a quarter of an inch, or the urease inhibitor. But the other part of that that I think people need to understand is the volatilization, that's nitrogen lost to the atmosphere but how much of an environmental concern is that volatilization because it's dollars out of my pocket but what about the environmental side uh, you know i saw some numbers today a bit of that does become this nitrous oxide that we're most concerned about uh, but i think more prominent than that is i think it contributes to smog uh, ammonia loss and uh, some of the others on the line that are uh, better tuned into environmental losses may, may know those, but it's not a direct nitrous oxide loss. This is ammonia. And so it's got to go through some pathways before it converts to that. Right, but it's dollars out of your pocket for sure. Well, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think that uh, we've been working on that for several years and, and folks are well tuned in as to the risks uh, and, and when, when they employ strategies with urease inhibitors, stuff like that. I, I think farmers are pretty tuned in on that. Um, I, I would argue that that might be more Western than East, Eastern, but uh, regardless, we should, we should probably move on to number six, yeah. slide six, Jay. Sure. Yep. Okay. And no, oh, you skipped one. Geez, we jumped a few. Yeah, uh, maybe. Okay. Uh, that, this, Here, is one, that, that, this is the one where you bought a lottery ticket, Peter. Uh, this is the big pool. And, and we can lose quite a bit of nitrogen uh, uh, in this way. And what we find with the bottom slide there, if we immobilize nitrogen, and that's when we have a, like a big straw load, uh, things like that, where we have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio and the bugs first 
use our applied nitrogen to help decompose straw. And so they'll sop that up, sometimes at the expense of the plant. And later, uh, as that stuff gases off as CO2, then the carbon to nitrogen ratio narrows and then we tip that jug and we actually get water coming out again or we get mineralization. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of tough to know how long does that take? How much will I get? Uh, Mother Nature plays those cards. In Western Canada, we know that we can control this immobilization by banding nitrogen below the residue layer. The physical uh, or a simple physical uh, placement away from the residue helps us limit the amount that we tie up in immobilization. I don't know if this is something that, that you guys are big on in the East. So, don't think question. so. Okay. Yeah, I, I also want to point out, Ray makes a good point that I'm probably not going to speak tonight, except to really just move to the next topic and maybe yeah. thank our sponsors. Okay. Um, but Greg, okay, so this is a good question on whether or not uh, should we be somewhat worried or do we deal with this more when we're dealing with things like manure and those sorts of things? Yeah, I think the idea of trying to reduce immobilization by positioning it in, in the eastern humid climates, I'm not sure that that has a, a, a big deal. I mean, if we put nitrogen close to the surface, if we put it deeper, I'm not sure it has much impact on how much immobilization occurs. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I think the ace up this leaf is to get enough rainfall to take it into the soil and do some separation from the residue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. But but I would Let's say if some... you if you think about oh. immobilization, if I'm if I'm putting nitrogen on following wheat with the straw left on, or if I'm putting nitrogen on corn on corn we need an additional 30 pounds of nitrogen. And that's because of some of this immobilization from the extra residue that we've left on the surface. So Greg, you're right. We don't generally look at it from a positional standpoint, but we're still needing to add extra nitrogen if we have a lot of high carbon residues in, in the system. And so that's that's totally an immobilization standpoint. Otherwise we'll, we'll starve the crop. And my last point on this, which I think a lot of people maybe don't always think about, but we grow these cover crops and Lindsay loves to have her silly woolly pigs out eating cover crops. I do. But when, when we put oats there, the oats pick up some of that nitrogen and they sort of immobilize it in the, the oat growth itself. And man, trying to predict when that oat growth is going to become available nitrogen to the next crop gets really tough much easier with a legume but when we go to grass cover crops they really do tend to remove some of that nitrogen out of the system and make it into limbo almost where it's a, a big guess where it's coming back so and we have some questions in the chat that so jim has asked a really good question about fall testing and nitrate tie up and all those sorts of things and nitrate testing sorry but i'm going to save it because i know it will come into play a little bit later so jim i'm not ignoring you or the comments um i just know we're going to work some of the answers out uh, through our discussion and even uh pete you have hit on part of that discussion is as we work cover crops into the system does that if we're framing it in the in the context of managing our losses yay that's important. Great. Cool. We're keeping soil where it is. We're, we're keeping some of those nutrients where we want them. But to your point, this has to translate to crop production at some point. And so we need to be able to count on when that end comes back into the system. And with grasses, that is proving more challenging. Yes. If not impossible. If not okay. impossible. There's no okay. such thing as impossible, Mr. Johnson. Okay, moving on. Okay. We're going to get yes, this figured please, out. Please. Yeah, let me chug on here and distract myself less. <laughs> okay. Wait, next slide, please. Next slide, Jay. Okay. Yes. So this, this is, is the nitrification process where we go from ammonia or ammonium to nitrate. And when I was in school and my other uh, esteemed senior colleagues here, this was just a straight pipe that we knew that it went from ammonium to nitrate to nitrate 
and then the plant fed on that. Uh, but it's in recent years that we've learned that that pipe is leaky. And uh, if you bear with me, I've had it explained by Mario Tenuta how this happens, because this is where it is uh, agronomically insignificant, but this is where we get the lion's share of our nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. And it's as this generally occurs one to four weeks after we apply nitrogen, soils are warm, we get a rain, and this process chugs full bore. And as it does that, it can outpace the availability of oxygen. This, this process requires oxygen. And as oxygen becomes a bit limiting, there's denitrifiers in the system. And they, when oxygen runs a bit short, they use the oxygen from nitrite and gas it off as N2O. So that's the process that we never knew that happened before good instruments. But the little bit, the 1% of the nitrogen that we apply that leaks out this way, that, that's the culprit. That's what's causing the big lion's share of the problem. Um, and, and I think, John, just to add to that, because I think a lot of people think that that only happens when the soil is totally saturated. But in mm -hmm. actual fact, it's when the you've just had that nice inch of rain and you think, oh, I've got good soil moisture. It's it's maybe too wet to work, but it's sure not saturated. You wouldn't you wouldn't think of it being oxygen deficient, but it is actually in those that that first rainfall that we get those nitrous oxide spikes when when we aren't totally saturated. Yeah. So, uh, and I was speaking at American conference last week, and this this is kind of news to them, but their, their thinking's been muzzled for a while, so they're ju they're just coming to light on this. Uh, anyway, everybody uh, agreed tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got more American listeners, I hope. Any, anyways, oh, uh, the, the the picture at the bottom so shows that we manage that, and actually we've got some pretty good tools. If we slow that process down, nitrification inhibitors. Uh, they dampen that loss of nitrous oxide. Uh, also, banding nitrogen in the West works to help with that and uh, applying it to cool soils so that progresses at a very slow pace. Those all seem to be in our favor of slowing that particular loss. But uh, we're going to go to the next slide, but we're going to focus on that uh, NO3 up in the top left-hand corner. Uh, Mario likes to call that, that's loitering nitrate. That's, that's good stuff to have, but only when the crop is actively sourcing it. Uh, here, I turn that valve off. That's called winter in Manitoba, when that valve is turned off. Loitering nitrate, we store it out here. If I was in Ontario with tile-drained fields, with cover crops, that valve would be open, and nitrate possibly moving down further. Where it can move down to, on the uh, left-hand side, it says denitrification, and that's the classic loss of uh, nitrogen, not just as N2O, but as N2. And in our studies out here, on, this, on these saturated soils, that the, the bugs that can reduce nitrate to N2, they, they're voracious. They don't let much escape as N2O. They take it all the way to N2. So we don't measure much. The exception being in thaw, when uh, Dr. Eric Beauchamp used to explain this to us at Guelph, that that spring thaw, when most of the soil is frozen, but it just melts and thaws on the surface, this process can happen. And at that stage, we lose about 25 to 35% of our N2O out here. So it, it's it's at uh, spring thaw and then nitrification. All right. So, John, I'm going to pause you there. Yep. Hang on one moment because I want to get Greg to hop in here on this. But I do have to uh, yep. because already we're zooming along. I did want to send uh, very quickly a thank you to all our show sponsors uh, while we're moving through this. Give everybody a chance to grab a glass of water. Uh, but tonight's show is brought to you by Adama Canada.
um, and Disruptors, an RBC podcast, and uh, Canola Masters, and of course, Decisive Farming by Telus Agriculture. See the bigger picture at Decisive Farming by Telus Agriculture. We can help. Let's optimize your fertilizer costs and replenish your soil by tailoring nutrient plans to your field's needs. Visit DecisiveFarming.com to learn how to get soil health insights today. All right. Okay. Back to the thick of it. Into the thick of it. Um, okay. John, uh, I've just okay, got I'll let you finish one and then I'm going to go to Greg. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just one more thing. And this is the physics part of it is that middle bucket is leaching. So that's not really dependent on a micro a biological process or anything. It's just that uh, nitrate, when it, if it's loitering around and you're on sandy soils and get rain, it can move and it can move out of the root zone. Probably more prevalent in Ontario than out here. You get more rainfall than we do. But again, that, it's a, a, a serious pathway that we need to recognize. So maybe your objective there is to prevent too much nitrate from loitering around until the crop needs it. Mm -hmm. So that's my question, I guess, Greg, when you see this schematic and the concept of loitering in, in the Ontario context, where would you see this occurs and how do we, how are we most likely to lose loitering in? Yeah, I'm struggling a little bit with the term loitering nitrate. Uh, we always used to just call it the nitrate pool. And the general goal for us in the East, and I think it's probably the same idea, but it's just the size of the nitrate pool, trying to keep that nitrate pool as small as possible during the, during the time when the crop is not taking nitrate up, keeping that nitrate pool small so you reduce the risk of, uh, of either leaching or denitrification. Um, but and, and so that's all good. I think we're with that. And, and, and we know the strategies more or less for reducing the overall size of the nitrate pool. I guess I'm just not 100% clear, and we need to discuss this this evening, whether that target of just keeping the nitrate pool small is, is doing everything we need to do to stop this uh, nitrous oxide that sort of leaks off during... Uh, during this er these early events, sort of the May rainfall events, that's still a question for me that, that I'm not sure we've completely answered, but John and Peter may have the answer. So I, I think- So Peter, do that, you have the answer? Yeah, so, no, so I, I, I think if you have less, well, we know that split applied nitrogen will reduce nitrous oxide emissions through the leaky pipe, because when we get that rainfall, there isn't a, as big a blast of the ammonium nitrogen driving through to nitrate. And so you don't go, the, the bugs don't go as oxygen starved. And so you, you reduce the amount of nitrous oxide emissions. You also reduce the size of the nitrate pool. One of the other challenges is, of course, if you don't get a big enough nitrate pool in Western Canada and you, the, the tap turns off, then sometimes you can struggle to get that nitrogen that you put on the surface or, you know, into dry soil to shift over to nitrate and become part of the nitrate pool where the plant can pick it up. And, and that can happen in Ontario as well, right, Greg? But I think, I think your question is valid. And I think the answer is managing the size of the nitrate pool in the early growth stages of the crop at, you know, preceding in corn, preceding in cereals, we can reduce the amount of nitrous oxide emissions, but we can also actually get more nitrous oxide emissions if we don't apply that nitrogen appropriately. If, if you go in at six leaf corn, when that nitrogen demand is just starting to spike, you put that nitrogen on the surface, you get that half inch rainstorm or, or quarter inch rainstorm enough to really start that process you could actually increase your nitrous oxide emissions as well. So it's not, I don't think just the size of the nitrate pool in that early stage, it's about timing, it's about placement, it's about all those other things in terms of trying to reduce that nitrous oxide emission. Uh, the one at, at, at Thaw that John talked about, that's just gonna happen and, and very little we can do about that one. But the one from the applied fertilizer, that one we can do something about. Okay. 
All right. What's next on on this list, John? Are we moving into? Uh, well, so, so I, I, I I think I'm ready to share the platform. If if you wanted to do uh, one of Greg's case studies, we, yeah, I, we I, that or, or Lindsay, I think it just there's been some some questions in the chat that really relate Good. to what we've okay. talked about. So maybe we could go to yeah. some of those and and then we'll go to Greg's case. Okay. Uh, case study yep. Sounds I think good, because we well. have a couple things that I definitely want to tackle. Um, and one of them, of course, is moving into. Um, so some of it comes around that post-harvest nitrate test. So in Ontario, we don't test for N in the fall. We test in the spring. We test in season. So that, of course, brings up, though, our ma management of those acres in the fall. So a lot of the questions that are coming in have to do with either cereal rye um, after corn and thinking about and tie up. Uh, but then also, you know, should we be, Jim asked the question, with cover crops, um, should we be testing nitrate in the fall to see what isn't necessarily perhaps tied up? So how, why are we in Ontario not testing nitrate in the fall sort of across the board? Who wants to take that one, Peter or Greg? Well, well, we don't test nitrate in the fall because it's meaningless because what, no matter what you test there in the fall, it won't be there in the spring. Mm -hmm. so, so where does it go? It, well, it goes down and up. But, uh, but, but I think yeah. just, to, just to put a little finer, a little finer mm -hmm. point on it, uh, a soil nitrate test in the fall might indicate whether you had excess nitrogen applied that year but it's so transient you can have a guy that measures on the first of october and looks like he's got excess nitrogen in the fall his neighbor who put on the identical amount of nitrogen tests four weeks later and he comes up and says oh i don't have excess nitrogen at all so it's just the idea of our nitrate so is so transient that the number is essentially i think meaningless in the fall for the most part and the other part of that answer, Lindsay, and Greg's bang on, it's meaningless mm -hmm. other than to to determine did we put on too much for that corn crop or for that wheat crop. But the mm -hmm. other part of that is it's nitrate in the fall. And so that nitrate, it can leach. That's a health issue from blue baby syndrome. We don't want it in the groundwater. Or it can denitrify, but when it denitrifies, it's under saturated conditions. So it goes off as nitrogen gas and nitrogen gas is not an environmental issue. The, the air we breathe is 78% nitrogen. So when it goes off as nitrogen gas, it's no big deal. So that fall nitrate really is not an environmental issue other than if it leaches into the groundwater. What it is, is it's a whole lot of $5 bills floating out of Greg Stewart's fat wallet because that's just, you know, it's it's hard on the pocketbook, but but that's about all it is. Okay. But, but, just, so but now... just to repeat that point, it's also a difficult number to actually trust just because of the timing and the rainfall and you know, so you could say, yeah, you lost a lot of money. Uh, yeah, you might have, you might not have. It's really difficult to test in the fall and capture that. Maybe, maybe at the end of September, black layer, if you happen to be out there and capturing some nitrate levels in that, in that window, but boy, it's a, it's a tough window to capture and, and feel like you know what you're talking about. So then some of the other discussion is also about the tie up or the immobilization part with so uh, specifically with cereal rye after corn in that and and the three of you are you know we've talked about this as well is that we are we need to support the crop with the nutrients it needs the crop we're, we're trying to grow we're trying to feed a yield goal so we want to make sure there's enough and available when that crop needs it but depending on what a rotation is or what our organic matter is all of these other factors come into play and sometimes the solution is adding more M, right? So we're trying to get around some of the challenges of the unknown or tied up N by adding more N. So how do we balance making sure we're not adding too much or also potentially losing some N by trying to make up that difference? I don't know if I'm explaining it right, Peter, but I'll throw to you because you like to talk about fertilizing after cereal rye. 
So, yeah, actually, and, and there's a, a bunch of questions in the chat that, Lindsay, I think pertain to this. And the one was, is, is it better then to remove the straw? Well, it's not better to remove the straw from an organic matter standpoint, because that straw will become organic matter. Mm -hmm. But because mm -hmm. you have more high carbon residue there, you have to add a, some additional nitrogen so that your corn crop isn't nitrogen starved. So if you remove the straw, you need less nitrogen, but that does have a, an organic matter long term component. The other part that that Ray points out is that Jim was was really talking about growing a fall cover crop and measuring nitrate after my wheat crop. If you're going to measure it after the corn crop to grow fall rye, I think that's useless Be, for the reasons that Greg said that the fall rye doesn't grow much in the fall and we're going to lose that nitrogen over the winter. But if we are going to grow oats to feed Lindsay's silly woolly pigs after my wheat crop comes off, then sure, a nitrate soil test then could help us determine, do I need to add 50 pounds of nitrogen to that oat crop or 100 pounds of nitrogen to that oat crop? And the last comment I'll make is around this whole rye question. And then that one's been incredibly interesting because if you, if you, cereal rye and you want to take it as a forage it removes a lot of nitrogen because it's a high protein high yield forage and if you look at the new york data and tom kilser 200 pounds of nitrogen you need to put on that rye cover crop and if you don't apply that nitrogen on the rye cover crop then the corn after it really suffers badly. And, and Dr. Dave Hooker is in the chat here. And in some of the research he's done on the oat cover crop following wheat, if you don't put any nitrogen on the oat cover crop, it has a negative yield impact on the subsequent corn crop. So you actually lower the corn yield. Whereas if you apply 50 pounds of nitrogen on that oat crop, that, that yield drag from the cover crop tends to go away. So this is, it gets really complicated and you would think 200 pounds of nitrogen, man, the environmental impact of that is horrendous, but we also have to grow good crops. So really interesting how that balance. And so now on the rye cover crop, we go back to some of the things John talked about in terms of, is the soil really cold? Because when that soil is really cold and we put that nitrogen on, then we're a little bit less likely to see some of those loss factors because everything happens much slower. All right. So Jay, producer Jay has already told me there's no way we're getting to clips tonight, but that's okay. We've got lots of other fun things to do. So we are going to though, which I love. This is the way I learn. I love case studies. I like specific examples and what the solutions are. So before we jump into those, because Mr. Greg Stewart has some really good ones for us, um, I did want to, of course, send out another shout out to our show sponsors. We have Adama Canada, Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture, Canola Master, and oh, we're going to go to Canola Master. That works for me. I was going to go to the Disruptors podcast, but that's okay. We call ourselves Canola Master because we want every canola grower to achieve growing perfection. Master your canola with a 160 acres of gold giveaway. Enter today at canolamaster.ca. Conditions apply. That's live for you folks. you got to roll with it. Okay. Um, okay. So, Greg, walk us through it because this is how we learn. We're going to talk about some specific instances and how we manage our end losses with them. So I think we're gonna start at slide seven. There we go. Walk us through this. I don't expect everyone to write it. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it works best if I just zing through it. Laura is a farmer. She believes that at least 135 pounds of nitrogen needs to be applied to her corn crop at or before planting to protect yield. Uh, she's been burnt too many times by wet dunes when she could not side dress on time or dry dunes when she felt the end was left stranded at the surface. So Laura's plan right now is, is working pretty well for her. She gets down 87 pounds of N as you read a broadcast. She hits it with a shallow cultivation. She plants the corn. That puts about three pounds of N in furrow. And then very soon after planting, she weed and feeds it, which is essentially 15 gallons of UAN with their herbicide program. So that's her, that's her plan to get 135 pounds 
of and down relatively shallowly, right? Uh, in uh, in or around the planting window, uh, she she does come back and dribble band UAN in that 30 to 60 pounds of N June 15th to July 10th high clearance dribble band option and uh, and she's still committed to do that. However, uh, you know Laura's been listening and looking and hearing and Johnson's probably been uh, you know in her face uh, talking to her about nitrous oxide. Uh, and now she's sort of questioning, well, wow, this strategy has worked pretty well for her. She thinks it guarantees her her best chance of yield from a nitrogen timing perspective. But where is she at in terms of uh, above average nitrous oxide emissions? That's the case study. And the next, slide now, really is, the next slide is just really yeah. John and Peter telling this yep progressive Ontario farmer what she's going to do differently to try to not lose yield but maybe save a bit of nitrous oxide emission who wants to go first who's got a bright idea put up your hand John or Pete or or comments yeah, well, too I, I, oh, I, always like to say, I, I always like to say I hate it when when people uh overreact and start beating themselves up thinking that they're doing things wrong and a lot of things that Laura's doing there are right. Like she is split applying. I count three splits there, uh, pre-plant with the weed spray and then later in season. So already she's implementing uh, one of the uh, important aspects to reducing the, the total load of uh, nitrogen nitrifying early in the spring. So I, I, I see that uh, uh, there's a couple check marks that go there saying that, yeah, you're doing a good job. And if you want to do more, uh, I think then, then she could consider using some uh, enhanced efficiency fertilizer. But first I wanna tell her what she's doing right. Uh, you're on Peter. Okay, so I, I think John's right. She is splitting, but the 135 up front, when she has very low demand, is maybe trying to build that that nitrate pool a little bit earlier than we need to. And so, two things. First off, or, or two things that I think that we should discuss. One is she's shallow incorporating. So uh, that first shot of. Uh, of nitrogen, uh, what was it now? 87 80, pounds of 87 nitrogen. Pounds. Yep, 87 pounds of nitrogen, shallow incorporating. So does shallow incorporation automatically mean that I have reduced my, my potential for loss? And now, John, I think, I mean, nitrous oxide is one thing because mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we do much with that shallow incorporation for the nitrous oxide side. It's more the amount of nitrogen we apply, but I'm also looking at, at uh, Laura's bottom line and have I reduced my volatilization loss by that shallow incorporation? Mm -hmm. What are you, you asking think, me? What, what's your, yeah, I'm asking uh, you, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep, I, I've seen that go wrong both ways, or I've seen it go wrong if we don't get rain after. Uh, you, you know, there's a, a fair bit of vertical till or harrowing out here, and any time, sometimes we lose less nitrogen if we just let it sit on the bone dry soil, because nothing happens on the bone dry soil. But you tickle that into some moisture, and the clock starts ticking uh, towards losses. So. Anytime that you expose it to moist soil and then you get drying conditions after that without rainfall, uh, yeah, volatilization losses uh, would be the major concern. Yeah, Greg, do you agree or what's your thought process there? Yeah, well, this, uh, this is a three inch S time cultivator with a good set of harrows on the back. I don't know whether that's deep enough. We have ran some trials where when we hit when we hit uh, uh, UAN with a fairly shallow cultivation, we could eliminate or nearly eliminate the volatilization losses. That same tillage tool hitting urea, granular urea, did not reduce those losses nearly as much. So 
Yeah, I think this is a cool question. If, if you're broadcasting 87 pounds of nitrogen as urea and you're hitting it one after you've applied it, hitting it one time with a high quality cultivator, Harrow's on the back, running about three inches deep, do you eliminate the volatilization losses? I'm not Pretty sure. Hard. Yeah, I think, I, 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 would, think I, would, I would like to think so, but Johnson has me doubting myself, which is a 35 year pattern. But anyway, that's. Uh... <laughs> but but it is. Wounds. I, I think, I well, think the well, other part. Well, rule book says three inches is good. Right. So but three good. inches, remember, John, I run the cultivator at three inches and 80% of the fertilizer oh, well, will be in the top inch and a half. And so mm -hmm. I think now from that standpoint, how fluffy is that left? And so, Greg, when you say a cultivator, Cultivator, a good cultivator with a, a, a good set of harrows on the back. Are those harrows firming that soil down enough so that you don't have easy access for that that ammonia to to get into the air and blow off? I think a high speed disc where we're running a packing wheel to keep keep the depth on the high speed disc. I think that maybe packs that soil enough maybe i think it depends on how fast you're going and how much packing you actually get but i do think that this this is a, a thought process and you know one of the things that if you're concerned about that and again it's not going to do much for nitrous oxide but from a dollar standpoint if we think 87 pounds is too much and we're concerned about that volatilization loss would be a urease inhibitor most mm -hmm. of the time we, we would struggle in that situation to to make enough or, or to stop enough loss that the urease inhibitor would actually pay the grower. That's been my, my general experience. John, I don't know what you would say from out west, but it's, I, I think it's something. To, yeah, it, it, it pains me to kind of agree with you, but I'm agreeing with you on the, the packing part uh, out here. Uh, people, good growers got bent out of shape because when they're seeding and only band their nitrogen uh, maybe two inches deep or so, uh, they're fretting over, uh, am I getting volatilization from that shallow band? And uh, because, yeah, some of that work done out east where it was done with hose and hoeing it in with fluffy coverage, yes, you did have losses. But when we do that, we run a press wheel over that band. And I've put the blue boxes on top and I've, I have not measured an atom of loss. So I think it's far more to do with press wheel coverage or, or press coverage than worrying about the actual depth. Uh, so in that regards, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Peter. Yeah. So maybe Greg, one of the answers to, to the question and, and John's right, she's splitting, Laura's splitting. So that's, that's already a good thing. Uh, she's run, pun, pulling the, the nice, cultivator with the with the harrows but maybe from a, a pure nitrogen loss standpoint a roller is not a bad thing now mind oh, you you get a pounding rain gosh, yeah i know a roller <laughs> feel your head his, man his <laughs> poor corn crop beater. yeah i'm gonna send my guy out in oxford county with a roller to <laughs> take their beautiful soil and smear it down into place <laughs> never now, again i would be I would prefer to do something else, like cut the rate of, uh, okay. of urea or put in a urease inhibitor uh, before I'm going to pack these fields to try to stop a little mm -hmm. bit of nitrogen to blow off. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, I, that, All right. So well, that's, why don't you just put down ESN, incorporate it, and be done with it? Okay. So question. Where do enhanced efficiency fertilizers fit? This is Jason Vote asking, which we've covered a little bit of this, but slow release versus controlled release. Let's talk a little bit. So in general terms, we hear these terms, controlled release, slow release. What's the difference? Where do they fit? Greg, in this scenario, uh, you did mention a urease inhibitor. So do we need to be more specific than slow release, controlled release, or can we identify what that really means and where they fit. Yeah, well, I, I think in this situation, if you really are convinced that your shallow cultivation in damp soil is, is not going to stop the volatilization losses, then your target has to be 
a volatilization inhibitor to uh, to hold on to that nitrogen, right? And so, I, I just to me that's a hard that's a hard thing to get my head around. I uh, I'm not sure that I could spend twelve or fifteen bucks for a volatilization inhibitor when I'm broadcasting the urea and I'm doing a good job of cultivating it in. I'm just not convinced the losses are are big enough there to warrant. Uh, a urease inhibitor. I realize that if I'm if I'm harrowing it, or if I'm leaving it on the surface, or if I'm clearly super shallow placement, that I've I pretty much got to do a urease inhibitor approach. But in this idea of cultivating three inches deep, I'm just I'm not sold on the fact that I have to have a urease inhibitor in there yet. I would sooner cut the rate to 47 pounds and drive on maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I I totally actually concur with that. I mean, she's already side dressing, and so that is is increasing the nitrate pool when the crop needs the the nitrate, and so maybe rebalancing the the timing of her nitrogen applications and and pulling back. And and by the way, from the more recent research, Lindsay. You know, Greg will hit me over the head, but you you look at at what uh, Emerson Nafziger has done on corn. We can't short the corn crop for nitrogen in the early growth stages, or we actually lose a nice bit of yield. So I don't want to see Laura cutting back below about 100 pounds of, of nitrogen in that pre-plant or, or you know, early growth stage window. So we're not going to cut her from 135 pounds of nitrogen back to 50 pounds of nitrogen, I don't think, unless we're going to really move that side dress up early and make sure that we get that side dress into the crop so so there is the balance there from in terms of trying to to avoid the loss but but still make the the highest yield possible all right okay so there is a bit more i want to explore on this but we are getting short on time i am very quickly uh going to get in a last shout out to uh our sponsors for tonight's show of course to adam I canada decisive farming uh, and Canola Masters, and of course, Disruptors, an RBC podcast. This fall, it's tackling a critical question. How can Canada help feed the world while simultaneously slashing carbon emissions? This special three-part series features an array of experts working up and down the food supply chain, including farmers, academics, scientists, and restaurateurs. Listen for the growing challenge on Disruptors wherever you get your podcasts. All right. And I do want to remind everyone, of course, uh, this uh, tonight's event is a knowledge sharing event. Um, and so everyone get your phones ready because in just a few moments, we're going to have that QR code uh, for both our friends out west from the Canola Council and for the OFCAF uh, funding here through Ontario Soil and Crop in Ontario. So everyone make sure you have your phones handy. We'll be getting to those QR codes in just a moment uh, because we are rapidly running out of time. But there's still so much to cover because one of the things we haven't talked about entirely yet, and I know we're focused on reducing emissions, but part of this whole discussion is keeping money in our pockets as well and or um increasing profitability so we may give up on yield but do we gain on on profit so greg i'll ask you all of these conversations i'm sure with with your growers go or circle around profitability as well so how do we work that into this equation of managing our losses well in, in this particular case study I think you have to try to make some choices that don't cost you money or sacrifice yield, but do steer the boat away from uh, nitrous uh, oxide or, or 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 other emissions, uh, ammonia emissions. Uh, you know, so Dave Hooker mentions in the chat here. You know, why don't you get more into the band and take some out of the surface application? Uh, that sort of addresses Peter's question of making sure that there's good nitrogen supply right in the row zone well you could do that without putting 135 pounds of total n down and i would argue peter that you could probably do it with 60 pounds of n not 100 if it was in and around the row zone now your pushback will be you know who's got a capability on their planter to get 60 pounds of n in or around the row zone right that's a uh, that's a challenge. The strip till guys have a bit of an automatic win on that front that they could put 60 pounds of N in a strip till system 
and still run just three pounds on the planter and maybe say, I'm not going to lose any yield because I've got 60 pounds of N in the row zone, but I'm going to reduce nitrous oxide because I haven't broadcast the other, you know, 75 pounds in a, you know, over the landscape. And that's, I think that, that argues well. Um, so, so, so I think some, some reasonable decisions. And, and in this case, I could see myself spending obviously money on urease inhibitors for the weed and feed, the UAN that's going to be sprayed straight on the soil surface. I, I would be putting my urease inhibitor money there and not in my urea money that I'm going to in, incorporate as best I can. Right. So a couple of, a couple of thoughts anyways, to how to make some decisions without, uh, without really costing you much. And I'll just jump in quickly and say, you know, Greg, UAN is already half ammonium and half nitrate. So the urease the inhibitor that you're using is only protecting 50% of that nitrogen. So, right, like like there's all these yeah. different factors. And it is right it, on the surface. It is right on the surface. But if the surface is dry, right, in John's example, if the surface is dry, then... I'm okay, long as I get that half inch of rain and move it into the soil surface. The one last thing that Dave Hooker put in the chat that I think is that we haven't, you know, maybe hit on quite enough is that, yep, you use, you use a stabilized nitrogen product and you're going to reduce your nitrous oxide emissions. And I think, I think Dave, that research is pretty solid most places. The challenge really becomes that you're saving nitrous oxide that one or two percent of your nitrogen but from an economic standpoint that's the challenge right because that amount of nitrogen generally is the very smallest portion and and so we, if we can if we can reduce losses it's good all the way around but it, it's just man it it's a it's a tough nut to crack all right okay so just quickly i'm going to share these qr codes because then i have two things um to tackle that have come in through the chat um one of them about uh strip tillage yes warren strip tillage um but yes yeah, so for anyone in western canada uh that's working with the canola council the 4 r advantage uh program you can capture that qr qr code there um and so we'll give you just a moment to do that if anyone has any issues with these qr codes anything like that uh please just my email address is lsmith at realagriculture.com actually i should hand out pete's email address that's probably better um anyway no lsmith at realagriculture.com if you have any issues and then of course we will also share jay if we can switch over to the off calf uh the the off calf qr code will take over the whole screen um and yes so please uh, if you can capture that and uh, take that through. If you have any issues, again, you can send me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com, uh, and we'll connect you with the people that need be. I do think Margaret is around. Margaret May is around in the chat. I'm not sure if she's on Facebook or YouTube, uh, but you can ask her there as well. Okay, we are running out of time, but we have two things. So... Um, two of the things that I definitely want to cover. John, I'll go to you first. Um, we've talked about the NRAMP work you've done before. What did that look like in 2022? So Jason Vote asked this, and and I'm quite curious too, because to for anyone who hasn't watched this show, Manitoba had an interesting growing season. Um, and I use the term very loosely, didn't really get in the field for quite some time, had a very interesting harvest season as well. But did you do the NRAMP work in 2022? And what did it look like? Uh, we, we do a much simpler uh, system now rather than putting in a big suite of rates. All I do is go in and broadcast, I think, uh, uh, 25, 50, or uh, maybe 25, 50, 75, or 100 pounds of extra nitrogen on top of what the grower has already done. And then we walk away. And if we can't see that out there in the field, then that farmer can rest well assured that they have probably provided full nitrogen for pretty good yield potential. But if all of a sudden, as in some fields where we saw where we had some high losses on sandy soils, if my oats where I put on nitrogen is, is eight to 10 inches taller, well, then I know what I should have done. Uh, and that's always the challenge is, does this give you a signal soon enough to do something about it or not? Uh, but uh, 
that, that's, that's what I just like to do is, is to just uh, put out a, a simple little check out there in the field. I'd love it if farmers would do this with one full pass across the field, put in a enriched strip. But uh, for, for me, uh, I can get in enough mischief just putting in these 50 foot by 50 foot spots. I can't imagine Peter or Greg have ever had issues with farmers putting in test strips. It happens every <laughs> time, right? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, by the way, I do have growers with winter wheat in Ontario that actually do what John just talked about. They put in a higher nitrogen strip all the way up the field, one strip wide. And if they can see that strip, they go out and add more nitrogen to the winter wheat crop. Okay. Good. Scientific enough. Yeah, there we go. Where's our, where's our, is that an, is that enough science, Greg? I don't know. Okay. There is a question about strip gel. It, I, I know I'm going to try and, um, I mean, it's, it's too complicated to answer entirely, but strip tillage does give us some options and, and some management tools. So Greg, um, and, Someone else shared in the chat that we do have a new Sharp Edge video that just uh, went up on YouTube and Real Agriculture that looks at uh, strip tillage and cereal rye uh, for corn. So go check that out. Um, but the question of essentially, you know, how much can you put, how much N can you put down in the strip? So obviously that depends on a few factors, but what are we seeing as far as using strip tillage and N management working together? Well, I, I think it, it captures some of this discussion tonight, the ability to not give up yield, to concentrate in, in and around the corn plant and reduce some of the dispersion or the, uh, the potential losses from, for broadcast nitrogen. Uh, I think you may be asked about how much nitrogen to put in the zone or how much you can put in the zone. Uh, that's a bit of a tough question because strip tillers are not all created equal and the zones they create are not all equal. But I think that the general safe rate in, an, in a strip tiller that, that sort of mixes the nitrogen in, into a zone that's maybe six inches wide and six inches deep, and I know I'm just trying to throw numbers around here, but I think that's between 90 and 110 pounds of end, actual end, can be put into that zone where it's worked in somewhat incorporated into a zone six by six, and you will have very little chance of burning the crop. Uh, you start adding potash into that zone or increasing the rates beyond 110 pounds, then I think it gets uh, risky. All right. Now, so I'm not sure if it's Harvey or Bruce that's on, but hi, either of you, they're neighbors of mine. Um, does in-crop soil testing, is it not effective? So what we haven't really talked about in this conversation, of course, is that we do use nitrate testing. We do go in and top up the corn here in Ontario. And I mean, that is an important number that is used, but do we can, I mean, we can manage without it, but it definitely is a useful tool. So Peter, I'll go to you on this one because this year of course was a very interesting year for, for those nitrate tests. So how much should we be, we be waiting on that test to make those decisions? So I, I think, well, not, first off, you have to split your nitrogen if you're going to use the, the, uh, uh, side dress nitrate test right so mm -hmm. like you you so right away you've taken one step forward to reducing emissions and reducing uh, losses from your nitrogen because you're you're splitting applying you have to be a little bit careful if all you use is the nitrate soil test it explains about one third of the variability in response to nitrogen in the province of ontario and that generally is not good enough However, it can be an unbelievable tool if you put it in context. And so this year, Lindsay, and we've talked about this, but, mm -hmm. but livestock farmers with repeated manure applications over the history, were coming back with nitrates through the roof. You know, 10th of June, I've got 90 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen that's that's what 360 pounds of available nitrogen how could you need any more and yet that grower normally would have applied another 100 pounds of nitrogen or 80 pounds of nitrogen that the growers that didn't they had tremendous corn yields 
But if, mm-hmm. if it's a single, if it's Peter Johnson with no history of manure and I go out there and I put manure on once and I look at that test, I have much less faith in it just because we seem to get too much. Maybe it's just variability in that one time manure application and those repeated applications build up a pool over time or I, I'm not sure what's going on, but I, it's an incredible test but you need to use it in the context of what you know about that field. It's just, it it has to be used in context. And I think what we've pointed out is that a history of manure, Peter, is gold. And so for everyone who wants to make fun of my sheep, there you go. Um, Okay, we have had a request uh, for the QR codes to be put up one more time. So Jay, if you could, we're going to share, I think the Canola Council one first. So everyone, please grab your phones um, and we'll get those QR codes shared uh, one more time uh, for for those who missed it the first time. So if you can, please. Uh, So that is for all our Western Canadian friends uh, with the Canola for our Advantage QR code. And then, of course, we have our OSCA off-calf as well. So we'll put that one up too. And for anyone who uh, has a nitrogen management approved project, this qualifies as your knowledge sharing event. So please uh, just snap that picture using um, the camera and it should take you to a form to fill out. So there you go. Um, All right, we are over time and that is a surprise to no one. I think perhaps the most surprising thing this evening was that Peter said he didn't have a history of manure. And that's, of course, entirely false. Um, okay. No, there are so many things, of course, that we we could share on this topic. This is, I think, the um, third time we've tackled this topic. And uh, just this year, we will do it again. Uh, I'm sure, because nitrogen management is one of those that we cannot possibly cover everything in an hour. That's why we keep coming back to it. And we will probably do this again. Well, I promise we'll do this again in the new year. Um, But of course, to Peter Johnson, to John Hurd, to Greg Stewart, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise tonight. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And Yes, and thank you to everyone who joined us in the chat as well. Fantastic group tonight. Some great questions. Apologies to some of the ones we didn't Hi, get Randall to. Hi, Randall <laughs> Yes, Ray. Hi, Ray, for being here. Um, yes, and and uh, lots of thank yous coming in. Uh, so, gents, if you can't see the the comments, uh, wonderful. And I agree. Gord Specksnyder Speck Snyder says, great session. Another hour, please. We will do it again uh, for sure. And, of course, for all of you who collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow and let us know you watched. And shout out to all of our sponsors, Adama Canada, Decisive Farming, disruptors an rbc podcast and canola masters all right thank you everyone we'll see you again next week 8 p.m eastern right here cheers everybody Good night.